what, I, what I'd like to say is that uh, um, many of you have uh, talked about Know the Glow and looking at eyes is the first um, the first time uh, you see these uh, young children uh, were noted to have a problem in their eyes. And uh, what I want to take you on is a little tour uh, of the inside of the eye, what I saw when I saw Jack. Uh, what I see when I see a, a young child come in. And hopefully that will let you know that uh, kind of uh, literally uh, give you a great idea of really what we're up against. So, um, um, so the question is, uh, why are you here? Um, most of you have some love connection to Jack, to the McGovern family. Some of you have uh, children who've had coats. Some of you are here for apparently the world's largest salami. Uh, and uh, I have no idea what it looks like, but they're apparently they're the largest in salami. Um, but, but this has um, become something that, you know, unfortunately for Jack, is no longer about just Jack. Because when you look at Jack, you see a thriving, smart, articulate, collegiate athlete. It's very, very hard to convince other people that he's got a problem. So let's go inside. Can I have the next slide, please? I'm going to give you a crash course in retina. Um, I will tell you the Bay Area is super saturated with retina specialists, so don't uh, tread on my turf. Don't use this knowledge against me. And start doing this. But this is a normal retina. This is what I hope to see when a patient comes to see me. What you see here is we've dilated the eye. We have special lenses that we can use. Light goes through the center of the eye, and you see basically a panoramic view of this is a, a healthy retina. The retina is actually transparent. So this orange hue you're seeing is the lining underneath the retina. This is the optic nerve, and these are the blood vessels that run within the transparent retina. These are the arteries, these are the veins. And this central part here is the macula. This is responsible for about 80% of your vision. So I spent, um, I don't know, four or 10 years learning about normal and abnormal, but you'll see very easily the, the difference between a normal and a normal period. So this is a patient with coats. Not so, not so. Why is it yellow? Well, your blood contains red blood cells, which are literally floating in liquid. And in that liquid is dissolved cholesterol, dissolved fat. It's basically a fluid. If your blood vessels within your retina are incapable of being normal, they begin to leak that liquid part. And the fat that's coming out of that liquid begins, begins to basically harden just like uh, you know, the hard soap scum on the side of your bathtub. And it becomes this yellowish, uh, dense deposit underneath and inside the retina, and we call that exudate. Occasionally, the blood vessels are so abnormal, they, they literally burst open, and you see blood here. You see a little tiny area here where there's uh, literally kind of an aneurysm. If you think of an aneurysm being a horrible thing in the retina, you can see this as well as a horrible thing. So this young boy, seven year old, he's got 20 20 vision. That's how he can pass his school exam. That's how no one would ever notice without a dilated examination to know that he's at risk. Because once this area gets here, his vision is going to go down. And uh, next slide. And eventually, if the fat gets into the middle, if the leaking gets into the fovea, like it did in this young patient, fat everywhere. What you can't see, because it's a flat image, is this retina here is so swollen with plasma and with fluid that it's literally separated from the, where it's supposed to be, and that's called a retinal detachment. And so you hear about retinal detachments being an awful thing. It is an awful thing. It's hard to fix. The prognosis really drops when you have a retinal detachment. So in this young 13-year-old boy, he comes and he's clearly lost vision, but because you and I don't always check, and kids even less aren't going to check. They don't want to stop uh, playing ball. They don't want to stop looking at the school. They don't want anyone to, to know they're in trouble, including their parents. We have a problem with delay in diagnosis. And then you get to this point. This is a, a patient where everything is out of focus because the retina is totally detached. 
This used to be where the optic nerve is. I can't tell you where the macula is. You see how this patient is not going to do well. Even with surgery, patients ask about what surgeries can I have. There's nothing you can do. This is actually a, uh, I'd say a 15-year-old boy who came in, total retinal detachment. We, we do our best. We have some medicines, uh, actually great medicines that have really looked at some of the, uh, the poor prognosis children that we used to see. But you're not going to be able to save this child. This is a child with a total level of passion from coast disease. So behind that node of glow, this is this is what we're seeing. This is what we see when we diagnose a child with coast. That's all. So what have we been doing? What have we been doing with your hard-earned dollars? Um, it's hard to say. Uh, when you first come in, you don't hear this press. Uh, you don't hear about any fantastic scientific discovery. You hear about the gene studies and everything that's going on. And you don't hear about coats. You don't hear about all these kinds of things. One of the first things the government did very early on, next slide, was they basically sponsored, and you guys probably all know this, but they sponsored some of the, the great luminaries in the field. I'm saying luminaries, but I actually made it on the title. Uh, but it wasn't me. But basically, Early, uh, early support from the McGovern Foundation allowed just a little bit of scientific contribution about patients with coats. And uh, we have here the Jack McGovern Coats Foundation. This is the first publication, hopefully there will be more, uh, in which we're trying to add to the, the world's knowledge of coast disease. Next slide. So why so slow? What's going on? In order to uh, solve this, everything is turning towards genetics. So everything, cancer, heart disease, everything in your body, a lot of it, was probably fated to happen because of what your parents gave to you. You add to it, subtract from it, what, with what you eat, what you smoke, what you ever don't smoke, uh, and so on and so on and so on. But basically, your DNA, turns out, is the huge frontier and what huge and billion dollar drug companies are looking for. They're looking for genes that cause disease and either fixing the genes at the start or coming up with a medication that will specifically attack that gene. So we're talking about a whole different thing than scraping off tree bark and calling an aspirin and giving it to you. So, so the, the problem with genes are, it's not like CSI. So if you've ever seen CSI, within one hour, uh, on your PDR, if you fast forward, you can get through and get the answer because there's some rare disease the criminal or the suspect had in 45 minutes. It's not that way. It's much more difficult. In order to get, for instance, some diseases, it's very easy to, if you know exactly where that gene problem is, you can run a test and you can get the answer. Cystic fibrosis is an is a, is a example. Hope is not that way. Macular degeneration is not that way. Diabetes is not that way. High blood pressure is not that way. These are much more complex. In order to really look to see, you're going to have to actually find and type the entire human genome of each individual. It's incredibly expensive, incredibly time consuming. And what has happened is that uh, there would be no one who would ever want to do it for a disease like Coast disease, which is relatively common. Why, why would you do it in America where it costs billions of dollars to take a drug from early research to FDA approval and then to marketing? It's billions of dollars in years. So why would any company ever look at codes? I don't know. We have a company through um, you know, Sherry and Gloria left, but for whatever reason, uh, uh, the McGovern um, magic or whatever, they became involved. And uh, I'm sure it's not 100% altruistic, but they are looking at samples. Uh, at this point, 112 coach patients that the McGovern Foundation sponsored, they're looking at 100 coach patients and almost 200 relatives of those coach patients and literally doing type letter by letter DNA to look for any sign of 
specific, any kind of common pathway that any of those 112 patients share in hopes of deriving exactly what caused the post disease in those patients. That's an incredible thing. I, it's, a, it's something I've never ever seen a company do, not for a disease like this, never. One of the reasons why is because there are other conditions that leak a lot, like diabetes, and that's where I'm saying that there's probably a little bit of non-altruistic behavior or something in it for them, and yet there's not there's not a reason why they would have responded except that here we have a foundation that has uh, a well-known disease, and you know this disease uh, has not been newly discovered. It's been around since 1898. It's been around for hundreds of years. We've known about it. We've never been able to cure it. So why so slow? It's a bad disease. It's not as simple as cystic fibrosis. The analogy I tell patients is, this is like looking for a star that you never, ever knew existed. And you're literally scanning the sky looking for what we call signal. And you're hoping that that signal means something. It could be noise. It could be... We may not find the gene with this go around, but that's what they're doing. They're doing the survey. This is not dissimilar for, we're talking about, some people talk about looking for a needle in a haystack. This is looking for a needle in a haystack of nails. It's really hard to find this. So, throughout this, you know, one of the things, um, if you know Tina and you know Ed, um, they will not let go. Um, they will call and they'll say, what's going on with the status of the research? What, why is it so slow? What's going on? And we actually need that pressure because it's with that that we keep pushing. It would other, otherwise be a very slow, slow, slow process. But at the end of this, our hope is that we're going to have something uh, that we can give to patients that may, if not a cure, may resemble something like a cure. And then all of a sudden, we will be able to give so many more kids who uh, didn't get what Jack got, which is a chance to grow to be an adult, a chance to use their vision, a chance to walk in society as if no one knew they ever had the disease. So I thank you very much as a physician. Um, I'm an honorary medical advisor. Um, I look forward to being promoted to Sergeant Arms. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much.